Well, hey there, Wallace Church. Pastor Cullen here. Excited to be back with you storytelling through the book of Acts. For the last several weeks, we've been looking at the quote-unquote conversion of Saul, this miraculous moment in chapter 9 where Saul on the road to Damascus has an experience with the risen Jesus and then goes through his Damascus journey of converting to Christianity and beginning his preaching ministry. Um, and then he leaves Damascus and returns to Jerusalem. And now we're going to take a break from him for about a chapter and a half. He's the main character of the rest of the book of Acts. And that's why I spent so many weeks talking about this conversion and how it's highlighted through power metaphors. Because power is what I think would be the main narrative of the book. It would be the main metaphor through which the large themes are communicated. And so with Saul taking a hiatus for about a chapter and a half, we get reintroduced to who we thought would be the main character of the book. Peter, the main character from the beginning of the book, the one who gives the magnificent, magnificent sermon in chapter 2. We get introduced back to him, and he has two stories here that I think are really interesting, and they could be, caps, they could be summarized through these words or this phrase, good works and acts of charity. I don't know about you, but some of my most fond memories uh, are when I myself was doing good works and acts of charity, or I happened to be the beneficiary of good works and acts of charity. Uh, something about the generosity and the reciprocity of giving something without getting something other than the grati like the gratitude that we gave of ourselves to benefit someone else. This idea of selfless reciprocity of sorts. Those have been some of my most fond memories. Uh, if you're a parent, you know this joy regularly because we do this for our children all the time. If you're a spouse and you're doing it well, yeah, you should feel these things all the time. And they bring us some of the best memories that we have. What I would like to do is I would like to challenge us like Peter does to live these good works and acts of charity on a much larger scale, a more macro scale. You see, the first story of Peter, uh, he goes to Lydda, this little, this little area, and he meets someone named Aeneas. And Aeneas is paralyzed and has been for eight years. Eight years this man has been paralyzed. And so Peter shows up in Lydda and he goes to find the disciples. And among them, there is no 100% declaration that Aeneas is actually a believing Christian. The text says he went to go find some saints and some believers in Lydda and there he found a man. The next verse, or the next story, actually differentiates our healing moment by defining the character as a disciple. I differentiate these. I think this is Peter in this first one ministering to a quote-unquote non-believer or a, someone outside the community, this Aeneas character. And so... Peter looks at him. This man's been paralyzed, bedridden for eight years. Peter just looks at him and said, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, make your bed. And immediately, he got up. I think there's lots of things that we can glean from this. First and foremost, I think the most important thing to glean from this is that Whatever this moment is, whatever this moment of healing is, miraculous healing, spiritual healing, all of the above, it didn't take much effort from Peter. Peter was already on his way, out and about, doing things. And he happens upon a paralyzed man named Aeneas. And all it took 
was Peter as he's walking. Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Good works and acts of charity don't have to come in grand gestures. Good works and acts of charity can come through the smile. They can come through the $5 to the homeless person. They can come with the extra bottle of water. Um, good works and acts of charity can come in many ways. They don't have to be these grand gestures that take a lot from us. This didn't take much from Peter. The next one did, though. And I do think there's something to this. The next story is Peter is in Lydda, and some things happen, but Peter's in Lydda healing people, just like Aeneas, right? Um, but in Joppa, a very near uh, region or village area, near in Joppa, there is a disciple, and she is called Tabitha. And this is what the text says about Tabitha. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. Now, this is a disciple. Her name's Tabitha. It also gives her Greek name, which is Dorcas. Uh, this is very similar to Saul and Paul. She gets every descriptor of her that she could possibly get. She gets her title as a disciple and she gets a descriptor of like what she's known for as a disciple. She's known for good works and acts of charity. But here's the deal. The text, the story goes on. Uh, she gets sick and she dies. And so some people run over to Lida and they get Peter. And what the text says, verse 38, Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went to them, went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas has made while she was with them. Peter went um, to a more explicit act, a more dire act of caring for those closest to us, caring for the community. You see, this is why I say it all the time. Christianity can't be a religion of privileged people. Christianity cannot be a religion of privileged people because when it's introduced into privilege, it forgets its purpose. That the community of the believers, the community of faith, is supposed to be the tangible experience of the love of God. To say it another way, this is my favorite way to say it. The people of God should be a medium. We should be a medium for the love of God that we've been shown to others, those inside our community and outside our community. We should be this experience of the reality of the love of God, that how can people look at us and go, yeah, I believe that their God loves me when they don't. Or yeah, I believe that their God loves me when they say that, but they don't even love each other. You see, well, how I want us to be known as a people of good works and acts of charity. If you haven't been around Wellhouse very long, then you don't know part of our vision. But our vision here at Wellhouse is that we want to operate. We don't do this currently because it takes a lot to grow into an institution. But we want 30% of our money to be infrastructure, for us to exist and do the rhythms that we currently do in life. We want the other, another 30%, we want to give it away to other organizations that are doing ministry and justice initiatives that we can't do on our own and so we want to partner with them. But the remaining 40% of our income, our revenues, we want to be to actual justice works. We want to own 
homeless shelters and food pantries and foster homes and widow care and all of these things because I personally believe that one of the best things that we can do as Christians is be known for good works and acts of charity in the name of Jesus. That's what I think these two stories tell us about Peter. The rest of Peter's story goes on. He brings this woman back from the dead. He resuscitates her. Everyone cheers and lots of people come to faith. In both of these stories, lots of people hear and come to faith. Because a good message of Jesus without good works and acts of charity is just a monologue. No one cares. Why should I believe that your God loves me when I'm not even convinced you do? It's what I always think people say would say to us if we tried to quote unquote evangelize them. And so Wallace Church, I simply want to ask you, this is not a hard question this week. How can we be better, both as a community of people, as an institution, Wallace Church, but also as individuals? How can we be better about good works and acts of charity.